Hey, this is Ina, in with you in the fight back. I want to talk about Revolution in the Air, where 60s radicals turned to Lenin, Mao, and Che. And this is a book about the new communist movement, which was a largely Marxist-Leninist Maoist movement, uh, with a heavy third world bent that grew out of the 1960s. And the author was one of the participants in this movement. And through this review, I want to talk about many of the strengths of this book. And to begin with, the opening chapters where we, where he details the movements of the 60s, the anti-Vietnam War movement, the uh, Civil Rights Movement, the Black Power, the Native American movements, uh, the women's movements. And I really think this is one of the highlights of this book. The opening chapters give one of the best views of this, the best overall condensed versions of the 60s I've ever seen. It really ties it all together, showing how these these huge world cataclysmic events in Vietnam and across the United States were shaping the the hearts and minds, if you will, of activists on the ground, and how radical thought like Franz Fanon, uh, William Hinton, The Monthly Review, Mao Che, etc., were really having an impact. And in these chapters, he he really debunks the the thesis that there was a good 60s and a bad 60s. You know, the early 60s of JFK, Martin Luther King, and then there was the bad 60s of the Weathermen, uh, the Malcolm X, and and all this. And he really just shows, you know, there are, certain con there are certain continuities and discontinuities in this, where, yeah, maybe by the late 60s into the 70s, we see a certain downturn of activism on college campuses, but on the other hand, we do have the Vietnam veterans against the war we have indigenous struggles picking up and as a side I just want to say anyone who thinks JFK would be part of the good 60s really should have their head examined you know the whole escalation of Vietnam and uh, Bay of Pigs to name a few but from there from this analysis of the 60s we get a picture of the new communist movement as it's emerging and this is organizations like the Revolutionary Union the October League uh, the Revolutionary Union, which eventually becomes the Revolutionary Communist Party. And we really see portraits of how these organizations are adapting to theory, how they're interacting. And there are certain weaknesses in this, but the Revolutionary Union showing how they're going to campuses, how they're going to workplaces, how they're, and in general, the movement, how they're organizing study circles, how they uh becoming fused with workers' uh, the working class, how they adapting to culture. Sometimes they're encouraging drinking, which may be a little too much for activists who are already stressed out. Uh, they're, you know, maybe some movements are adapting anti-gay attitudes, or rather, they're and are pushing away from the counterculture at the same time. Segments of the working class are pushing toward it. But this really is a great strength of the book showing how this the 60s influenced the these radicals and really how they hope to build a mass movement that is hope that can affect revolutionary change and ultimately a lot of these movements have either become moribund or are so marginalized they're rather insignificant but for me when i originally read this book I was rather sectarian anti-Maoist at the time, but you, he really helped change up some of my views on that to show that these were committed, in many cases, idealistic activists who had a real hardcore anti-racist, anti-imperialist point of view, and and he, it helped to take Maoism seriously as a uh, political movement. But that that's a certain strength of this book. A weakness that can be found in Revolution Air is the author's politics. Normally, I try not to attack someone's politics unless it's in some way relevant to the argument they're making in a particular work. In this case, uh, the author was a member of the Line of March, which um, grew out of the rectification movement. And this is all found in Revolution in the Air, so please look it up.
And he, the movement line of March sought to move away from the rather more dogmatic portions of the new communist movement. And they, they sought to maybe be more flexible with the national question, uh, gender. And they were involved in various anti-intervention works, uh, movements in Central America and so forth. But and this certainly colors some of the arguments in the book, is that the line of march eventually came to view Maoism as outside of the communist movement itself. And that certainly brings in a particular bias, because I'm not quite sure how much of this framework the author still shares, but I would suspect that he probably shares a great deal of it, because if Maoism doesn't belong in the communist movement, and this is a book largely about Maoist movements, then certainly we should take some of his uh, pronouncements on Maoism with a certain grain of salt. And furthermore, the line of march uh, took some rather, uh, shall I say, questionable positions. They supported the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, the crackdown of solidarity. Uh, that's, uh, that's a little too much. I mean, just because the, the Soviet Union claimed it was socialist and somehow its actions were justified, that strikes me as just because they wave a red flag that you can support them, even if there's really nothing but to support, to back up the waving of that red flag. Because certainly the Soviet Union in the early 80s was a rather repressive bureaucratic society that I think only the most hardline pro-Soviet people would claim to be socialist. And furthermore, this backing of Soviet policy led to a rapprochement with the uh, Communist Party USA, which by the 80s was a pretty moribund organization that was uh, really tied to the Democratic Party machine. And that certainly colors this. This strikes me as a rather almost apologetic for the movement's uh, for the line of marches. Uh, positions that parts of this book, you know, you know, yeah, the the new communist movement was struck with was filled with all these anti these dogmatic uh, Maoists and here we are, we were trying a more sensible approach, but let's say his criticisms are justified of the larger Maoist movement. I don't think they are necessarily. But to suddenly go the other way and go support the uh the Communist Party USA and the Soviet Union? Not quite. Another criticism that I do have about this book, and partly the author's politics, is he takes a rather um, positive view of the Jesse Jackson campaign that a lot of the anti-revisionist uh, new communist movement uh, members took part in the, in the early 80s. He says it was the only large-scale opposition to Reagan. He said it had a lot of grassroots and um, people of color support. And let's say all of this is true. The I tend to have a rather uh, negative view of any participation in Democratic Party politics because the Democratic Party is just it really is just another bourgeois party, and certainly it would probably be, in my opinion, more appropriate to look at the Jackson campaign as largely a co-option of a lot of the activists who were opposed to Reagan, and I believe this happened with a lot of the new communist movement who became involved in this certain line of march, the uh, Revolutionary Workers Headquarters, and the uh, Proletariat Unity Leagues being some. and now the off, now he does go into about how the Jackson campaign was eventually bought off, but to and but he still seems unwilling to really look at the Jackson campaign. Maybe and I wasn't involved in this campaign and I can't really speak to it, but perhaps maybe ultimately a failure and really drawing a lot of radical strength and into the Democrat Party where you pretty much become de-radicalized as a result. And it certainly helps explain the organization I was once a part of 
uh, the Freedom Road Socialist Organization, which grew out of several of the movements involved in the Jackson campaign, and explained it really looked like the Jackson campaign helped to de-radicalize them in many ways, to really draw them back into this electoral politics. And since the Jackson campaign, certainly uh, there's really been no noticeable movement of the Democrats in any form of progressive agenda. And another criticism I do have of this portion is that he rather dismisses the Trotskyists who remained aloof from this effort and the Revolutionary Communist Party, saying they pretty much remained on the margins. And he just says that. I really don't see much there. I really would like something to say, well, what was the Revolutionary Communist Party actually doing during this period? I don't see it in this in this section. What were the Trotskyists doing? And that that's a real problem here because he's just looking at this electoral focus here, and I really want to see some of these uh these other activists, the Trotskyists, the RCP. What were they doing on the ground? You know, makes sense to me. Two further criticisms I have are the uh, rather one is the rather scant attention given to Trotskyist movements. Although this book is focused on uh, the Maoist movements of the 60s and 70s, as it should be, I feel like Trotskyism really gets a short, uh, the short stick here. Because he, he really dismisses the theories of Trotsky in pretty much a page or two. And that's fine, understanding why activists chose to embrace Mao, Che, and etc. as opposed to Trotsky. But the Socialist Workers' Party is, is uh, he says at one point it had about 1,700 members, which, although the Trotskys were no doubt smaller than the Maoists as a whole, they, uh, the Socialist Workers' Party, he claims, was uh, bigger than any single of the Maoist groups. And I feel like, you know, we should see more what they were doing. What were the Trotskys really doing in the workers' movement, in the peace movement, in anti-racist work. Maybe it was quite ineffective, but I, I, you really don't get that great a picture here. And although the Socialist Workers' Party has since become a uh, rather cultish organization, we're also given short shift to the, uh, the International Socialists, which is the current ISO. And I'd rather like to see more. What were they doing? He mentions they're doing some Teamsters work. Rather some more. I understand the need to criticize their third campus politics. That's fine. That's the author's right. But certainly some more substantive organizational work of the IS would, would have been appreciated. A second criticism and is this book rather lacks a personal touch. We don't get much in the way of personal stories of activists. We get these rather large campuses. This is how active cadre were infiltrating the working class or colonizing plants. This is how activists were engaged in study circles, how they're dealing with family life, etc. We're not getting, this is whoever, their personal story. We're not getting this personal touch, like someone who's their first day in a factory and they're just, they were originally a middle class student. You're not getting that. Now, he claims that it's, it was necessary to do this because of the stigma attached to radical activism in the United States and having a radical past. And that's understandable, but... Are you telling me you couldn't get anyone to share a personal story? Because if you read my uh, review of Richard Wolin's uh, Win from the East about French Maoism, there's a lot there of actual personal stories of Maoists who were in French factories, Maoists who were on the ground doing stuff. And it really added a certain layer of depth, you know. We got to hear these people in their own words how they were doing stuff. And that's something that's missing here, and it's certainly, it certainly impacts the work in many ways, kind of making it a little standoffish at times, because we may hear about the problems of worker, uh, activists in the abstract dealing with drinking and union work, but we don't get someone, we don't get a personalized story, say, this is Mr. X, and he's really, and his uh, account, and I would have liked to have seen that. I would have added a lot of that. Now, in terms of conclusion here, he goes into what he sees as two of the fundamental problems of Maoism. 
One is uh, he sees us also as deriving from a Stalinist legacy. It's the underestimation of the importance of democracy both within the movement itself and, of course, for the society that comes after. And the idea that they're a rather, you know, a dogmatic and single unbroken Marxist-Leninist continuity from 1848 to the present. And that this kind of leads to this idea that because there's this unbroken continuity, that whatever the party says, because it's the successor of that continuity, it's the Vanguard Party. But, it, but even though the party says this, it really hasn't won the allegiance of workers and oppressed. Now, I believe the second criticism is valid in many ways because we did see the a lot of these groups, and this isn't necessarily uh, limited to Maoism, but also to Trotsky's groups as well, where the organizations seem to think because they follow some, you know, line of apostle succession from Marx to Lenin to Trotsky or Mao, that they're the revolutionary successor, and it reads this sectarian, often dogmatic thinking. You can't work together with them because, you know, their their tree goes off a different way, their revolutionary tree. And but the important, and again, this goes to my criticism of the author in the line of March. Is remember he doesn't even see Maoism by the time he's in the line of March as even being part of the communist movement. So I'm going to take it with a grain of salt. And certainly some of these organizations did not practice democratic ways of uh, operating, like the Democratic Workers' Party. It was a cult. It was vicious. You can argue if it was Maoist or not. That's fine. But a hundred, let a hundred uh, schools of thought contend. Let a hundred flowers bloom. That's that's Mao. I mean, I find that hard to believe how that cannot, that should encourage democratic thinking. This clash of ideas and Remember, of course, the author takes a rather dim view on the Cultural Revolution, but what about the big character posters? All these uh, clashes of debates, you know, these, I mean, that that certainly strikes me as uh, rather democratic and airing of grievances. Now, I'm certain I'm going to get people saying, oh, you're not looking at the negative side of the Cultural Revolution. Well, we, we always look at the negative side of the Cultural Revolution, it seems, in the United States. Always looking at the so the persecution of intellectuals, not looking at the context. Who was persecuted? Why was it deserved? Was it not? And the thing about the Cultural Revolution, and this kind of goes to the author's rather elitist uh, when he's moving towards the Communist Party and the Soviet Union, is a revolution is not a neat thing, as Mao said. It's not a dinner party. It's not refined. You know, it's an act of violence. And just to look at that violence, as I believe the author does. To, and to, you know, supposedly undemocratic the ways of Maoist functioning is to kind of not get the whole picture here. So. The author does see plenty of positives from these movements, not just that they were tight, that these were organizations that were advocating social change, but that it, they really were pushed. They really pushed anti-racism in a in a sense we hadn't seen on the U.S. left for some time. And the discipline of the cadres, the the high level of debate that often get conducted, sometimes yes, dogmatic. And the fact that we really saw intellectuals, uh, college students, really pushing to be work with the uh, workers and oppressed is something that. It was a real positive impact. And yes, I've offered many criticisms of this book, and I believe they're justified. But the author does paint uh, quite an interesting portrait of U.S. Maoism and uh, art, larger um, left politics. And it should be approached in a critical spirit. Again, the author's biases taken into account. But this book is certainly worth reading. Okay, this is Ina. Till next.